absolutely. Hey, Lou, once again, folks, it is your host, Liz Sergey, here with the Tax Advisor Business Coach Success Podcast. Just a quick reminder that we are recording this in video, so for my subscribers on YouTube, now you can go and watch, actually, the interviews. Today, I have a special treat for you, for all my audience, because I have a super, super expert guest. And I'm truly honored to interview PB, known as Betty, Two for Yellow. She is a trademark attorney. And welcome, Betty, to our show. Hello. Well, Hello. Thank you. And Betty has an extensive background, and she has been operating an intellectual firm in New York, and actually virtually, because you do provide services ac across the nation. Is that correct, Betty? That is correct. Excellent. And internationally as well. Wonderful. She practices trademark law differently as a result of her efforts in over 20 years of experience. Okay, the firm has a 100% success rate with every trademark registration file, which that's pretty amazing. Also, they have had successful, successfully defended um, their clients in many occasions before many courts and by doing so, they have saved them millions of dollars of potential damages. So, Betty, what can I tell you? It is pretty impressive, your background. And, you know, as always, I love bringing, you know, uh, really good experts like you because it really helps the audience to, you know, open their ears and understand that, you know, legality could be a, a tremendous issue uh, when we're operating uh, our business, especially as we're growing, right? Because then all these other things can come along. So, uh, Betty, if you want to add something else to your background that I haven't, by all means, uh, free, feel free right now to do so, please. So, uh, you opened up by saying I'm a trademark attorney. I actually do patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, and everything that goes with it. My okay. training actually is uh, in science, and from there, after the first 10 years of my career, um, for personal reasons, I decided that I, I wanted to go into law, especially after I discovered this specialty called patent law. But what I do um, as an intellectual property attorney, um, and, and we discussed it offline as well, is I, I always say I protect people. I don't protect just inventions or ideas. Uh, and I protect companies. And in order for me to effectively do that, I need a lot of tools. And my tools are basically patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, uh, privacy and publicity rights as well. Um, so, so we do all of it. My passion, however, is trademarks. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people say, oh, she's a trademark attorney. <laughs> I'm a trademark attorney only because I'm passionate about trademarks. And there's a lot of reasons why. Let me give you a, for instance. Would you please share some? Yeah. What, what trademark is where you feel more inclined, more passionate? Well, I love trademarks because trademarks last forever if they're properly managed. Right. Patents only last 20 years from the date of filing. Copyrights last longer than patents, but less than trademarks. In the case of a copyright, if we're talking about an individual author, the life of the copyright is the entire life of the author, plus 70. If we're talking about a company, then the life of the copyright is 90 years. So in the case of patents, we're talking about 20 years from the date of filing, in the case of a copyright, we're talking 90 years if we're talking about a corporation. But in the case of a trademark, if generation after generation after generation is using the trademark in connection with business and interstate commerce, that trademark potentially can last forever. Okay, wow. so in terms of value, in terms of, of what you're getting for your buck, for your investment, trademarks, in my opinion, are amazing. The other thing that I like trademarks very, very much is in court, they're handled very, very differently. Hmm, okay. in, 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 in the case of a patent or a copyright, the first thing you have to convince the court is where your intellectual property begins and where it ends. So just so that 
you have a sense of what I'm talking about. Would you please, can you give us an example of where the audience can, can have a better I, idea? I certainly. So you have to think of a patent infringement lawsuit or a copyright infringement lawsuit almost as a lawsuit for trespass. What do I mean by that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What I mean by that is, you know, a cause of action for trespass. Think about it. Most of us own our own homes, right? Right. And most of us have a fence around our property. And our property is usually surveyed before we get a mortgage so that the bank knows exactly what piece of property they actually put a lien on. Okay. If your neighbor comes and knocks your fence over, and puts up a fence 10 feet into your property, your neighbor is in essence committing trespass onto your property, right? You go to your neighbor, you knock on the door and you say, hey, you gotta take your fence down because if you don't, I'm gonna have to sue you because you're on my property. Right. The neighbor doesn't listen to you and uh -huh. now you go to court. The first thing you have to do- And try to stop you, know, that's when the nightmare starts, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, but we don't wanna sue our neighbors, right? We all love our neighbors, but, Hopefully. but, but the, reason, the reason why I'm saying that is because I, I need to show what I'm talking about. Sure. And, and to analogize with something that people are more familiar with, this concept of patent infringement and copyright infringement. So the first thing you're gonna to have to do if you're gonna sue your neighbor to take the fence down is you have to convince the judge where your property begins and where it ends. You have to get your survey, you have to submit it, and you, the judge has to see it on the map and he says, right. oh, now I understand Mr. Fariello's property is 100 by 100, it is at this block, It's 2,200 feet from the crossroad. It's on latitude and longitude. I mean, if you look at your survey, you will see that it's a map of your property, where your house is located, and so on and so forth. So before the judge even gets into a decision of whether your neighbor is in, is in fact trespassing on your property, you have to convince the judge where your property begins and where it ends, and you have title to your property. Right. Patents and copyrights are exactly the same thing. They basically, you have, to, you have to convince the judge where your intellectual property begins. What is your invention in the case of a patent, right? right? Where does it begin? And you use words to do that. And those words are in claims. So the claims of a patent are basically your survey where you say to the judge, here's where my patent begins and here's where it ends. Gotcha. Same okay. concept with copyrights. Judge, this is my book or this is my poem, or this is my picture, or this is my movie, or this is my music. Once again, you get into a discussion with the judge where your intellectual property begins and where it ends. And let me tell you something, it's a pain because you have to put evidence in, you have to make sure that the evidence is accepted. There are, you know, it's a, you just don't walk in and, you know, uh, and wave your, your patent and say, this is my, my patent. It doesn't work that way, especially especially if someone challenges your patent, like like what happened yesterday, the day before, in the oil versus green case, where the oil patent was challenged and it fell, and they got into a whole big discussion of whether the United States Patent and Trademark Office even had the power to invalidate the patent. So, so that's the thing. In trademarks, we don't have that. In trademarks, we don't get in and say, this is where it begins, this is where it ends, this is my trademark. There is a little bit of who adopted the trademark first, right? but there is no such discussion. There is also some discussion, does the trademark merit protection? There is a little bit of that. But the, but the test in terms of trademarks has nothing to do so much about where it begins, where it ends, but rather it's about consumer confusion. The test in a trademark infringement is about the consumer. And so there's a totally different focus. And because there's a totally different focus, if that focus is taken into consideration when you first adopt your trademark, it is more likely than not that you're gonna prevail in court. So because the focus is different, the analysis 
mark from the get-go, from the minute you start your business, then chances are you're going to prevail if you've That's done nice. all your work done. So it's not a situation where your trademark could be invalidated. And then you get into a whole thing. It's not a slam dunk. But basically, why I love trademarks is, A, because they last forever if they're properly managed. And if they're properly managed, the test is about the consumer. And the judge gets it. You know, he, he, he looks at the trademark, he looks at the goods, he looks at the services, and he's like, yeah, I'm confused. So if the judge as a consumer is confused, then the consumer is confused. Absolutely. And so, and so it's all about consumer confusion. And some people argue that because it's not that objective and it's about consumer confusion, it's actually confusing. To, yeah. to, you know? But it's not. Because let me ask you a question. Right? I know you're the interviewer. But, but how many times? I, I love it. I, I love going back and forth. Times, how many times have you gone into a store looking for one product mm -hmm. and because you're in a rush and because the, the product is not very expensive, you walk up to the shelf, you grab one product when in effect you think you're grabbing something else? All the time. I think all, as a consumer, we do all the time and it's because it, it's same wording. They're using almost same color sometimes on, on the packages, right? right? So it could be, like you said, again, it could be very confusing because, and then, yeah, I mean, the price might drop a little bit because this is the generic side of, you know, the brand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, that is a very good example because how can you do that, by the way? Because if they do have, you know, a, a product, how is the law allowing that to happen where you have the competition right next to the real brand? How, how well, actually, that? that happens in the case of generic products, okay? There is one particular makeup remover that I absolutely love, and it's made by L'Oreal. Okay. It's very inexpensive. You can buy it at CVS, at Walgreens, at any of the major pharmacies. You know, it's available everywhere. L'Oreal makes amazing products. So I'm looking... Sure. You know, when you look at the bottle, it's it's kind of oval shaped. It has a round white head. It says L'Oreal. It's blue, right? Amazing makeup remover. CVS makes a private label product that is the bottle is the same height, okay? The same basic color. It varies just a little bit on the cap. But when you walk in, right, and you have to rush home to get, you know, dinner on the table or you got to pick up Johnny from soccer practice, you know how many times I've picked up the CVS product instead of the L'Oreal product? Then I get home and I have very, you know, we all wear makeup. All, all women and men now wear makeup. They have to remove makeup, right? I put... Yes. Yeah, I, don't even this. Pay any, I don't I don't even pay any attention. I put it on the, the cotton ball. I remove try to remove my makeup from my eyes. Yeah. I make a remover and the thing doesn't work as well as my L'Oreal. And that's when I realized, wait a second, I picked up the wrong bottle because I got confused between the packaging of the two products. So that's exactly the kind of confusion the trademark law is designed to to uh prevent and, and I to interrupt there for a second Betty that would the audience know so really I mean they could be similar but yet they're allowed by law to continue selling that product because even though they might be it's similar but it there's a difference because they did they, they, they alternating you know alternating uh you know the changes of the package maybe is that why they get away with that if we have a bad well, private labeling is a little bit different and, and it gets a little bit more complicated. But from a trademark standpoint, um, when you're a business owner and you're starting that Hey, Betty, I think I almost you lost you. hear me? Yeah, uh, I lost you for a few seconds, but you're back now. Yes, I can hear you okay. clearly now. Go Very ahead. Good. Um, so, so the reality is, so, so let's, let's back up a little bit, right? We were talking about patents, trademarks, copyrights, my preference for trademarks, I said, because they last forever and they have a different standard of analysis in court, which makes it much easier for a trademark owner with a good trademark 
to prevail, as opposed to a patent, which can be challenged, or a copyright, which also can be challenged. Trademarks, once you meet that standard, you're pretty much ready to move to the question of whether the infringer is hurting you or not. Okay. That's why I love trademarks. That's why I'm passionate about it. Now, what is a trademark? A Please. trademark is a source identifier. A trademark is very, very simple. It could be anything. It could be a word. It could be a logo. Okay. It could be a color. It could be a song. It could be a design, a particular structure. It could be a smell, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Even yeah, that's new. Yeah, that I yeah. never knew. <laughs> even, even an aroma, an odor, a smell can be a trademark. So anything could be a trademark if, two requirements, if it's used on goods or services, and it has to be in commerce. There's two types of commerce. There's interstate commerce, and then there's intrastate commerce, meaning commerce that only takes place within a state, inside a state, and you don't go outside the state. Interesting. Because we have two different types of commerce, we have interstate and intrastate, we also have two different trademark systems. Oh, goodness. We have a federal trademark system, which is what most people are familiar with, and we have individual state trademark systems. So, every state in the union, state of New York, state of Florida, state of California, state of Oregon, has its own trademark database for trademarks that are used exclusively within the state of New York, uh, within, within each state. So, the trademarks, like I said, could be anything so long as they're used on goods or services in interstate commerce. Now, the trademarks that you pick, you have to decide what you're gonna do with it, right? Because in my practice, for example, when I first meet my clients, because of, I, of the fact that I have a holistic approach to their business, my favorite saying is, I don't protect inventions and ideas, I protect people and companies. And so many times I will engage in a full-blown um, discovery process in which I try to understand what the client is looking to achieve. And based on their objectives and their goals, I will make a decision whether together with the client, we map up a strategy mm -hmm. where we'll say, okay, maybe we don't need to file for a patent or we don't need to file for a copyright or we don't need to file at the federal level it may very well make sense to save a little money and to save on cost to file strictly within the state and not go outside. You don't always have to file in the federal government unless you have big ideas to grow your business beyond your state borders. But let me interrupt you here for a moment, please. So that means, for example, if I go here in the state of Florida and I do a trademark, and I become successful in what I'm doing, and now I discover that I have competition in another state, um, you know, let's say it's Texas, uh, then if somebody can actually use the same name and probably sell the same type of product that I'm selling, because it's only yes. in between states and it's not a federal trademark, is that what? what that is correct. That's absolutely correct. That's because concerning. Trademarks, That's trademarks very concerning. Are it is if you plan on expanding your business beyond your state. And that's something that needs to be explored right from the get-go, right? Absolutely. You know, if you're going to be a tiny mom-and-pop retailer. Local. Where, local, very local. Or you're a tiny little cafe and, you know, you don't have any big ideas about getting bought out or going outside, you know, or expanding in your little cafe into a chain. Right, mm -hmm. like Starbucks or or Dunkin' Donuts, right? Where they're national and at this point they're international. That's right. Um, you know, so it depends on what your business objectives are. Depending on your business objectives, you can tailor how you're going to be protecting your intellectual property, especially your trademarks. Sometimes I don't even recommend registration, whether it's state or federal, because 
you can actually enforce your trademark rights in the absence of a registration under something called the Unfair Competition Statutes of the United States, which is the Lanham Act, the 15 U.S.C. Section 1125A. So, so it all depends on your business objectives. And a good trademark attorney should really sit down and discuss with their client where they're going with this. Is this going to be just a small mom and pop in the backyard? Or do the owners, do the owners um, have, have big ideas of where they want to take the business? There's a risk associated, however, with that. Because if the first generation wants to stay local, but the next generation that What's actually it? wants to expand, right. you can actually get yourself into a lot of trouble. Oh, no. So this is something that shouldn't just happen on the first day you have your first discovery meeting. This is something that needs to be evaluated maybe every quarter, every year as you move forward because things change, right? Life changes. Absolutely. You know, stuff happens. Yes, it and, and it can move very quickly from one year to the next, to the next, to the next. And all of a sudden you're going from a tiny little, you know, mom and pop situation right. to I want to go nationwide. And then you have to adopt a totally different strategy. Uh, and I have represented clients who have been exactly in those shoes. And now what we're doing is we're kind of backpedaling and we're trying to to get ourselves in the place where we want we want to be. So, Amazing, Betty. And, and, and please allow me to do a little interruption here because I think what's really important is your explanation has been incredible. Um, and I think it's so confusing that, like I said, when it comes to anything that has to do with the you know legal issues and, and counting too and all that, it, it, you know our terminology can you know kind of throw people off a little bit there. So we're trying to make it, folks, as easy as possible for all of you to understand out there. So, um, it, you know, one of the the clientele that I have it, it has to do a lot with e commerce right mm -hmm. so what happens um, when you mention the word you know mom and pops you know kind of local store or you know it could be anything from a pet shop all the way to maybe a little boutique right yes. um, but again like you said now in these days I mean we have you know so much opportunity to expand so easily right that we can sell online and that's what most of us are doing um, yeah. personally I my, my business started it has continued in the cloud it's a yes. business. I never opened a brick and mortar uh, uh, location, never had the need for it. And, uh, and honestly, I didn't really want it either. So with all the headaches and everything else that comes along with the overhead and expenses. So, you know, when we do this, we're able to obviously offer, you know, uh, a better, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know rates for, for our clients but the point is with e-commerce this is what I see uh, and, and I think people are getting in trouble because they say okay I think I can leave this in the back burner you know and I can wait because I'm nothing now I'm just starting off and let me give you an example we have people that are starting special I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of private sellers in Amazon because a lot of people think when they hear Amazon they're like oh it's all about Amazon no we have a lot of hundreds of thousand private sellers that are selling on Amazon on the platform. Okay, uh, so what happens? Some of these consumers don't know that, and a lot of these are coming out with these kind of brand names because they want to create a brand name. And by the way, with Amazon, it was very easy to do a brand regist registration with them. You didn't have to prove anything legally that you had a trademark in your state. Not at all. All you had to do was pretty much tell them, this is the name that I want to use <laughs> for my for the product that I'm selling, right? And here I'm going to make a, a, you know, a label, I'm going to print it out, I'm going to stick it on my package. That's it. As long as they approved it, you had a brand on Amazon. Well, guess what? That's disappearing. Right now they have got into the last few months, especially this year, where they understand that they cannot be doing this. Even Amazon understands it. So right. this is a good point for you to might be getting to you know more in detail with that because I think that right now Amazon's kind of pushing back and they want to cover themselves legally too and saying, well, you know, we were we had this too easy, too open for anyone just to come with a sticker and say, hey, I'm ABC, 
you know, uh, pet supply. <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, that's how I'm going to sell online. And guess what? Maybe they're doing that through their own e-commerce uh, website, right? So it's not only through Amazon. These has to apply with eBay, Shopify, you know, all these big e-commerce. So what do you recommend to someone who's starting in, you know, it's kind of hard. We don't have a crystal ball how our business are going to go. Sometimes we can have capital. Sometimes, you know, a lot of circumstances, like you said, they can come up. But someone who's starting and they know that they have a good solid ground because they've done hopefully their surveys, they've done the research in the market. What do you recommend if I want to come up with a brand and say, well, I'm not sure I'm going on an e-commerce platform. So again, it's not local. But what would you say to someone who's going online into selling these platforms? The product? most important thing a person who's starting up a new brand is that, that they need to do most mm -hmm. importantly is a good trademark search. Very important. One of the things that many of the young entrepreneurs need to understand is that courts in generally don't like it when you unilaterally and arbitrarily without checking, without making sure nobody else is ahead of you, you pick a name that is already being used by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So typically young entrepreneurs, the first thing they do is they look for domain names. True. And they assume, they assume that just because the domain name is available, they can use the domain name as a brand. That is a really wrong assumption to be making because domain names are not trademarks. As a matter of fact, there are many cases that have come out that have specifically said that domain names are not intellectual property. They're wow. not. They're not a trademark. They're not a patent. They're not a copyright. Think of domain names like your telephone number. Do you really own your telephone number? No. Your yeah. telephone number is simply a code by which you're able to tap into the telephone network and through that telephone network be able to communicate with other people who also have gates or inputs into the telephone network, right? Yeah. And if you pay to pay, fail to pay the bill, that telephone number will be removed from you. Absolutely. Domain names the same are the thing same. with the domain. The same thing. You start right. paying. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Domain names are exactly the same thing. So we have a lot of case law that have said that domain name is not private property. It's not a trademark. It's not intellectual property that belongs to you. It belongs to the company that actually sold it to you with whom you have a contract to provide access into the internet. Right. Now, having said that, mm -hmm. okay, that means that just because a domain name is available, doesn't mean it's available to use as a brand. Another mistake people make is they assume that just because the corporate name is available, it's also available as a trademark. That is also wrong. Good so most brand, most companies, most people who start up, you know, sometimes they start on, your, on their own and they only do a domain name. A lot of people hire companies like LegalZoom and Trademarky and some of those organizations and they go out and they say, okay, I want to incorporate in Delaware or I want to incorporate in New York or I want to incorporate in Florida, you know, where, wherever that business owner is going to be. They go into the state database, they plug the name in, the name comes up available. Right. Now, I will tell you, if I go in and call myself John Smith XYZ, and then you come in and you call yourself John Smith ABC, both of those corporate names will be granted. The trade, the, the, the state does not look to see if corporate names are confusingly similar. Oh, goodness. So when your corporate entity, whether it's your accountant, whether it's your lawyer, whether it's, you know, legal zoom, whoever it might be comes back and says, Oh yes, the name is available. That doesn't necessarily mean that now you can take that name and slap it on your product or your <laughs> service as a brand. It is very, very important. Once you have seen that the corporate name is available and the domain name is available to also now search it to see if anybody is using it as a trademark. Excellent. Excellent. You must, because if you don't, it can be extremely problematic going down the line. You're going to get a cease and desist letter 
from and somebody. I'm sorry to interrupt there for a moment, Ben. I did want to share, a, you know, a personal story there because it happened to me when I started my business. And the reality was that, you know, I did the same thing. Uh, you know, I went to the state of Florida and put the name that I thought that I liked for my company and, uh, and everything was well and dandy, you know, I was registered, I paid my fees, right? Um, I went out, I got another, you know, domain name with the same name and with my also DBA, right? Yes. I said, just in case no one comes after me and then they try to take those domain and then I'm going to have to pay big bucks because right. by the way, that's a very common thing. At least a few years ago, a lot of people were investing into domains and doing that and then coming back and reselling you those domains in a higher price ticket, right? But here's the thing. So I bought my domain with my company name. I went to the state, right, and I paid my fees, and I would say that it was not even, goodness, I think less than a year where I get a surprise letter, and the letter states clearly from an attorney firm, hey, uh, you're using this name for your new firm in the state of Florida, but uh, this is a trademark, so you must, just like that, you must cease and decease within the next 30 days, and I thought, Oh no, I said, I already have invested in the first year a lot of money to grant, you know, my business. I said, that's not possible. What did I need to do? Well, instead of wasting my time and going online and trying to get all this free information, and by all means, I'm not here to criticize anyone out there, you know that very well, Betty. But the reality is, there's certain information out there, like people watching this video, listen to this podcast, which is very, very valuable information. And I always say that. We, we, we're we willing to give up a lot of our information that we can pay for, for this info. But yeah, we do it from a kindness because we want to help people out there to do the right thing. But there's times where we need to invest. We need to hire other professionals to really guide us, you know, through the right path. Because here's my, my conclusion and my story. The whole issue was that anyhow, long story short, ended up where I had to hire an attorney, they had to defend me, and they say, no, sorry, our client is right, she's able to use this, that, that single name because it's very generic, so they couldn't do anything with it. Um, and you know, what was really uh, interesting about it is that, you know, if I have been afraid of seeking professional help from an attorney to represent me in a letter and say, hey, stop right there. Don't accuse my, my client, you know, don't threaten my client. Right. So it's very important. So in the situation, because I know we're always ready to wrap up and we have a few more minutes. What I would think it's important for everyone who's out there and, and again, listening and watching this video, please, if you are in an e-commerce business and you know you're expanding right there automatically, uh, Betty, uh, come to Betty. I mean, come to someone that has the expertise to help you because the truth is that the last thing you want is, like I said, to get one of those letters in the mail or now, well, through your email because <laughs> they don't even bother probably even putting a stamp and oh, yes. drop it in the mail. Mm -hmm. And then, you yes. know, finding yourself because I know how stressful I was when I opened that envelope. And, you know, like I said, my, my, my head was spinning, but I knew automatically that I needed to go to someone who could represent me legally because I couldn't do it on my own. And like I said, I had a happy ending. A lot of people don't have a happy ending, right, Betty? So, well, so my suggestion is my suggestion is to hire someone who knows what they're doing. Okay. Even or you get the cease and desist. But just because, just like you said, you were stressed, you were upset, you were, you were, you know, very angry. You potentially, you, you were staring at the risk of possibly having to change your name and yes. starting everything from scratch. So my suggestion is, you know, that's great that you hired an attorney, but it's better if you hire somebody even earlier as you're picking your name to begin with, to avoid all that stress. Exactly. The other thing that a good expert will provide for you is counseling on how to pick a right trademark because finding the right trademark is also important. Gotcha. You know, because it's not enough to, to find a trademark that's not going to get yourself into trouble. That's one, uh, that's one way of seeing the coin, right? Gotcha. The first phase is you want to pick a trademark that's going to build your company, which is going to be recognizable, which is going to have tremendous goodwill associated with it, and which can be enforceable in Court. Because look what you just said. You said they couldn't stop using. They couldn't stop me from using my name because it was too generic. 
they were trying to enforce a trademark yes. that was not a good trademark. How do you think good they point. felt? Good point. How do you think they felt when they realized they couldn't stop you? Yeah. Right? So, so, so it's not enough just to say, oh, I don't want to have to change my name. How about what happens if somebody copies you? And let me tell you, if you're successful, you will be copied. The <laughs> highest form of flattery for a business owner is to get copied because it means that somebody else has recognized the value associated with your goods and services and the goodwill associated with your goods and services. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to ride the coattails of your product and your service. And so how are you going to be able to stop them? So getting someone who knows what they're doing, who really understands trademarks, um, and it could be, there's a lot of experts out there, some attorneys, some are not. You know, my suggestion is work with someone who's going to help you find a good trademark. I have, a, I have a couple of blogs that I have actually posted on LinkedIn. Okay, excellent. Uh, you know, how to find a good trademark, the difference between a good trademark and a bad, bad trademark. Um, and I have actually consulted with clients. I've had clients come in to me and say to me, I want to check this trademark. And I look at it and I'm like, this is not a good trademark. And we get into a discussion of what is good and what is bad. We do trademark searches. And on the basis of that, I can't tell you how many different clients I have actually helped move away from bad trademarks. And I've actually come up with good trademarks myself. Because your brand is very important. Picking a trademark is an art. And finding someone who has done it for a long time, and, and it's not necessarily a PR firm. It's not necessarily a marketing firm. That trademark attorney who does your trademark searches, who understands your product, understands your service, understands your objectives, understands how to reach out to consumers, understands the unique value proposition of your goods and services, that person can really help you nail down a trademark that will blow the market away. And that's what's important. And how do we blow market away, right? By becoming number one and having recognition with our consumer. So your trademark attorney can be your best friend um, because, because of, of that thing. There was a, I don't remember the magazine that published it, but a few years ago, I think it was Corporate Council um, magazine or international or intellectual property council. It was one of those, those magazines that was really geared more towards attorneys. Right. And basically they had done an article where they had interviewed companies and their relationships with their intellectual property council, their attorneys, their, their patent trademark and copyright lawyers. Every single one of those successful companies said that their IP attorney was their best friend. And they actually laid out how they had 30 year, uh, 30 year relationships with their IP lawyer. Amazing. The IP attorneys would sleep at their houses, would attend weddings, would, you know, would, would, you know, because your IP attorney is like your doctor. He or she has his or her pulse on your business. He or she understands the objectives and goals of your business, and they will help you find the right intellectual property that's going to bring your business to the stratosphere. And having a great trademark policy, and especially a trademark search. Let me just finish, because I know we're running out of time. There are two very important values that a trademark search and a letter of opinion that a trademark attorney will give you have. Please do. The first is most businesses have general commercial liability policies. Buried in their general commercial liability policies are definitions of what damages and what coverage the insurance company provides. Most policies provide coverage for trademark and copyright infringement. Think about that. Well, interesting. Mm -hmm. So long as, so that means if you get a cease and desist letter mm -hmm. and you feel that you've done nothing wrong, you can call up your insurance company and have them step in and pay for your lawyer. Any lawyer you pick, by the way, you don't have to use the insurance company's lawyer. Okay. They will pay for the attorney. And if there are damages that are assessed against you, they will pay for that as well. 
so long as you give them timely notice and so long as you haven't acted in bad faith. Having a letter of opinion from a lawyer or an expert who has done a trademark search and says, you can use this trademark, eliminates any inference of bad faith. Number one. Number two, in a court of law, mm -hmm. damages can be assessed against you if you have acted in bad faith. When okay. you have a letter of opinion in trademark search that says you have acted in a business manner that is reasonable, in other words, you did your trademark search, chances are that the most that can be assessed against you is an injunction. In other words, the worst thing that can happen is you're going to change your name and your damages are going to be minimal. So that alone is, is just so valuable that, that, Clients who don't do trademark searches before they adopt a trademark potentially have a lot to lose and, be, and find themselves in exactly the position that you were. And it sounds like you're absolutely right about it. I mean, uh, here's, you know, just to conclude here and wrap up the, you know, the, the episode, but I tell you what, I mean, Betty, I mean, you've been amazing and, and I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for all your wonderful tips because really any information that can really help the audience. So I, from, from my perspective, I think that anyone who's starting e-commerce, uh, it doesn't matter what you're going now, like I say, Amazon is starting to demand that, you know, new sellers have to have already trademarked. And like I said, it's not about sticking it on your package and saying, I'm called ABC Pet Supply. Right. Not anymore because they're starting to recognize that it's bringing up legal issues. Uh, possibly even against the company itself, Amazon, okay? Right, that's so, right. So, and, and, and we can go on with something else with a lot of issues going on with Amazon right now, right, with the sales tax and everything else that they have. But the point is that if you are going to sell, and you know that from the beginning, you're going to sell, you know, uh, even internationally, because remember the internet, there's no limit, that's right? right? So, no, I mean, you can, no boundaries. Yeah. Absolutely, you can have people buying from you products, especially from any country. I mean, it doesn't matter. So the point here is that if you know you're selling online and you have a potential of going beyond your local region, then by all means, yeah, you want to do a trademark because you want to protect yourself. And you don't want to say, like you said Betty, earlier, I mean, you just don't want to open a can of worms and, and find yourself in, in a bad situation where, you know, I was lucky, like you said, because I had a happy ending. <laughs> but a lot, like I said, again, I'm sure a lot of firms haven't had that, you know, position. But I feel pleased. I mean, it, it's very important. Not only, like you said, you know, your domain name, but obviously your state. But go beyond that. Go federal. Do a trademark credibly. Do a trademark want. search. That's correct. Do a trademark search. And, and a good trademark search is searching federal United States Patent and Trademark Office, every database of every state, international, because many countries, many, many companies register in their own countries, but then they export into the United States. Good point. So, yeah, that's a so what happens point. is, and in the United States, rights to trademarks come from use, not from registration which means that somebody could be using the trademark, could be using the trademark in multiple states, never registered the trademark in the United States, but is using the trademark ahead of you, and wow. they can actually stop you from using your trademark. They can. So, oh yes, in my office, when we do trademark searches, because we do them in house, we don't farm them out. In my office, we do every registered database that we, and we pay for this service. We actually pay. There's a couple of big companies that allow you to access every trademark database in the world. We do that, plus we do what's called a common law search. In other words, we sit there and we think, where is this people? So we, I, I represent a number of companies in the food industry. And I have a client who came to me and said, I want you, Betty, to do a trademark search for the trademark Sobrano, which is Spanish for sovereign, S-O-B-R-A-N-O. -O. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we sat down. We started looking at translations in multiple languages because we're a multiple language law firm. You know? we, looked, we looked at everything. We looked at Sobrano. And then I said, 
because I love food and I represent food companies. I, I said to my team. team, I said to my team, listen, let's check Italian registrations in Italy. And sure enough, we found a cheese in Italy. My client is in sausage. We found a cheese in Italy called Sovrano, S-O-V-E-R-A-N-O, -E Soverano. So I said, Hmm. And what's interesting is in Italy, this particular cheese is at the same level as a Grana Padano, which is a Parmesan cheese, very high name. Oh, so I looked at it and I said to my staff, how much you want to bet this cheese is exported into the United States? Good point. So we go back to the United States and we start doing newspaper brands, things like that. And sure enough, huge article had been posted about Soverano being sold in Washington, D.C., and it was being carried by all these delis. Oh, my I had my. to go back to my client, and on the basis of an Italian registration, which I simply followed my nose on, okay, right. and just went back and forth, because a good trademark specialist, someone who does this day in, day out, and it's their passion, they're going to think, how does business work? How does commerce work? Commerce works. How do products get in and out? And, and they are literally going to follow their nose at every different level. And that is when you know you have the right person on your hands and you can have a level of confidence that your trademark search is complete. It's not enough to just do the USPTO. USPTO, state international and then what's called common law search with a little bit of common sense so as you can hear folks it's a lot involved it really is and this is why again if, if you have plans and you're oh you're really selling you know on these kind of platforms you know take the time hire people that really can hire you especially attorneys who have their expertise because again this is something i always say uh, you know, as a doctor, as an attorney, as an accountant, you know, as an engineer, we all specialize in different niches within our own, you know, industry, right? our own career. So, you know, if you need someone who's going to specialize in trademark, now you have someone that you can reach out. And by the way, Betty, I know we, we almost... We wouldn't be on our, our, our time, but you know, I want to thank you so much. I really appreciate your time because I know that you have been in other interviews with well-known magazines and everything else. So you've taken the time to be here with us. I'm really grateful for it. And how can the audience reach you that way they know your website, your, your information, and, um, and that way they can reach out to you, please? You can find me directly on LinkedIn by simply Googling my name, Betty, B-E-T-T-Y, Tufariello, T-U-F-A-R-I-E-L-L-O. Or you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or even on Google if you simply type in Intellectula, which is the name of my firm, and that's I-N-T as in Tom, e -double -L -E -C T U L A W dot com or intellectuallawnewyork.com. Uh, we have two, two websites out there. You can find us on Google. We're, we're five stars on Google. Um, you know, whether you look for my name, Betty Tufariello, or you look for the name of the firm, Intellectual Law in New York, you will find us. Uh, we're, like I said, we're on Twitter. Uh, over 3,000 followers. We're on LinkedIn. Um, we're not, we're, we're, if you look for us, you'll find us. <laughs> you're going to find you, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, now did you trademark your name? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, we have patents, patents, trademarks, and if you look for patent attorney or trademark attorney on Long Island, New York, you will find us. Excellent. Well, once again, really, I, I, you know, we really appreciate your time because I know you're, you're, you are extremely busy and you've been very kind with so much information. And I think what's important for people to know that they're going to go through a little interview with Betty and this is information that she needs to gather that way she can truly help you, okay? So um, again, you have her contact information. Don't hesitate, reach out to her. Thank you so much, folks, for, for taking the time to watch, like, share, and comment. Not only our you know, video, but also our podcast. And into the next episode, again, Betty, thank you so much. You've been so You're kind. You're very welcome. Uh, My pleasure. We've been grateful, and uh, I wish you a lot of success. And once again, we really appreciate your time. And goodbye, folks. Thank you you have a wonderful me. into the next episode. Goodbye, everyone.
बाय बाय